really appreciate you guys coming here today. Um, I've been doing a couple different types of lectures, uh, a couple on uh, dealing with concealed carry. I don't know how many of you showed up for that. And then uh, they said, <coughs> been asked to talk about kind of a lot of the false claims that are being made in the, the gun control debate these days. And uh, there's a lot, and I'm sure we're not going to be able to get through them all. So, uh, uh, you know, we'll see how far we can get through them. But anyway, I appreciate you coming. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to rely on some graphs that you may have seen if you go and read the New York Times, or uh, this one's from Vox. Uh, the New York Times are from an article by Nicholas Kristof that's been used around a lot, kind of, you know, uh, <coughs> 10 salient facts on gun control. Uh, the Vox articles by a guy named Herman Lopez, uh, uh, kind of the US uniqueness in terms of guns and 17 graphs. Uh, we're not gonna have time to go through all of them right here. But uh, this uh, one by Lopez uh, for Vox, uh, was used extensively in high schools across the country uh, before the uh, March for Life last year after the Parkland shooting. Uh, Lopez told me there was something like 70,000 hits, or no, 30 million hits on uh, the page that they had because it was used in high schools across the country kind of leading up to the March for Life. So you probably have seen these types of graphs before. They look in different ways. This is on uh, homicides by firearm per million people. And uh, the United States is uh, about 30 uh, per, per million. And then they'll go and they'll show, they have 14 countries altogether, including the United States, Switzerland, and Belgium, Luxembourg, and so on. And uh, you know, one of the questions is, how do you take 14 countries? Um, they're looking at developed countries, but there's surely a lot of developed countries around the world outside of New Zealand and Australia and, and some of these other countries. And, and we'll go through and show that more in a minute. Here's a very similar graph from uh, the New York Times, the Nicholas Kristof piece. Uh, this one shows only 11 countries, has uh, uh, firearm homicides per 100,000. The United States is at three, then Italy and Canada and so on. Um, but what happens if we look at all countries? And this is for homicides. So, uh, uh, and it's not all countries. There's some countries that uh, don't report homicide data. And those are likely countries with very, very high homicide rates. But you can see here, if you look at it, the average homicide rate for the countries that we have data is this blue line right here. Uh, the median, which means half or above and half or below, is the green line right here, and the orange or reddish one is for the United States. Now, there are a few things to point out here. One is, uh, you know, these are the numbers that different governments put together. Uh, just like Chicago may fudge its numbers. There's a number of countries that do, and they tend to be the countries with higher homicide rates, like Venezuela, is well known for dramatically undercounting uh, the number of homicides. The true rate may be 50% higher or so than it actually is. China, uh, some other countries uh, uh, are probably under report their crime statistics by a substantial amount. The other thing is uh, these are homicide rates and not murder rates. And most people seem to think that homicides and murders are the same. In fact, they're not the same. Uh, uh, homicide is murders plus justifiable homicides. And the United States has relatively more justifiable homicides, we think, than most of these other countries. Uh, surely more than a lot of the developed countries do. And uh, you know, you're talking about 20% or so of, uh, of the murder rate involves these just, or is, uh, of the homicide rate involves these justifiable homicides. So if you were to go and adjust this, you'd be lowering uh, the United States rank significantly relative to these other countries. You'd probably be putting the United States here if we could actually go and look at murder rates. The thing is, most countries don't report murder rates. In fact, only a relatively small number of countries report uh, murder rates. 
Okay, well here it is for firearm homicides. So the graph I just showed you was for all homicides, and this is for firearm homicides. And you know, here in the United States looks a lot worse. Uh, the average is here, the United States is here, and the median is over here. So the United States is well below, in the top half, uh, likely in the top quarter or quarter percent or so. And uh, it's pretty close to the average compared to what I just showed you a minute ago. Well, why is that? Why are we so high relative to, with regard to firearm homicide rates compared to homicide rates? And you may notice here, just in these graphs, these lines are a little bit thicker, the words are a little bit wider. The thing is, the reason why we're so high is that, see how much thinner the lines are to compress? There's a lot more countries being shown here. The reason why we move up is because about half the countries in the world don't report firearm homicides. They only report homicides. And the countries that tend not to report firearm homicides are the countries with the highest homicide rates. And so uh, we're higher here, not because of the fact that we have a lot more firearm homicides than the rest of the world, but simply because countries with higher firearm homicide rates tend not to report that data. So it's, it's intrinsically flawed. Yeah, yeah. right. So, um, you know, so we're, it's very misleading just to use it, of course, <laughs> Uh, usually people in the pushing for gun control like to look at only uh, firearm homicides. So they're missing all these countries that have high rates. So this is uh, the homicide rates for developed countries, the OECD countries. There are 36 countries uh, that are classified as developed countries. So when I showed you the New York Times, when they showed 11 countries, or the Vox, which showed uh, 14 countries, they're missing out a lot of countries. And the countries that they just tend to leave out that meet uh, the OECD definition of developed countries are countries like Brazil, or Russia, or Chile, uh, Mexico. And uh, uh, you can see how much higher the homicide rates are. And also some of these countries don't report uh, <laughs> firearm homicides. Uh, and they don't report murders. Uh, so you can see the United States is high relative to a lot of countries, but there are a lot of developed countries that are much higher, or there are developed countries that are much higher. Now, the, the other thing that's usually brought up is gun ownership. And uh, the United States is pointed to as having a very high gun ownership rate relative to other countries. These data that everybody points to, if you read the New York Times, the Washington Post, or USA Today, is from a source called the Small Arms Survey. And the problem with the Small Arms Survey is uh, they don't tell you where they got their data for most of the countries. Uh, if you go through and read their footnotes, they'll have sources for like about 29 of the countries listed of the 209 that they have data for. And uh, the United States is way out there, almost 90 per, you know, 89 per 100, uh, 89 guns per 100 people. Switzerland uh, is up there with 45.7 guns per 100 people, and, and so on. Um, and, uh, but the problem that you have here is, uh, I, if, I just don't believe a lot of these numbers. They won't show them. And, and there are also issues about how to measure them. So for example, they're looking at gun ownership. Well. In some of these countries, the government technically owns the gun, but you're in possession of it. So in Switzerland, if you're an able-bodied male between 18 and 36, uh, you'll, you're mandated to have a machine gun, and in many cases, a handgun. Uh, and when you turn 36, you can apply to remain in the militia, and you can keep on applying to remain in it up until 65. And at that point, you're given the option to go and purchase the guns. But up, up until you're 65, the government technically owns it. Now, does it matter when we're talking about how people use guns, whether they're in possession of the gun or whether they own the gun? It seems to me possession is what the issue is here. And, uh, and Israel is something similar. According to the Small Arms Survey, Israel has seven guns per 100 people. Uh, but 
obviously gun possession rate is much higher. It's just that technically the Israeli government owns the guns. I mean, you may have possession of a gun for 50 years, but the government still, still owns the guns there. There's another issue here, and that is how do you measure gun ownership across different countries? This is number of guns per 100 people. I'm not really sure. I don't, in fact, I know. I, I don't believe that that's the best way to do it. It seems a big difference to me if I have 1% of the adult population or 1% of the population own 100 guns each, or I have 100% of the population own one gun each, okay, in terms of people's ability to go and defend themselves. If I only have 1% of the population owning guns, even if they own 100 guns each, probably really doesn't make much difference in terms of self-defense, whether they own five guns or 10 guns or 50 guns or 100 guns. Uh, and at least if people own one gun, there's at least a possibility that they can go and defend themselves. And so, uh, to me, the right way of measuring this would be the percentage of the population that owns guns rather than number of guns per 100 people. And uh, um, now, you've probably have seen this type of comparison. People use these numbers from the Stellar survey and they go and they'll make this claim that the United States has a little bit over 4% of the world's population, but we make up 42% of privately owned guns in the, in the world. I, I think this is just useless claim, because as I say, one, the small arms survey doesn't go and provide the sources of its data for, you know, uh, uh, you know, 180 of the countries that they go and uh, uh, claim to have numbers for. But uh, beyond that, uh, even for the countries that you look at, so let's say I have something like a, uh, a survey of when guns are registered in a country and you have to have licenses. Uh, I'll just give you an example or two. Uh, Canada, if you look at surveys for long gun ownership uh, from the early 90s or so, uh, you'll find that uh, about eight million, eight and a half million Canadians would say in these surveys regularly that they owned a long gun. Well, when you get to 98, when uh, the Canadian government started licensing uh, long guns, you had a situation where these surveys fell dramatically. They only registered guns to about three and a half million people. And that's pretty much what the survey showed at that time. Now. If you're gonna have five million fewer people within a few years own long guns, you have a couple options. Either one, there would have been a big rush for people going to gun stores to try to sell off their long guns that they had. Uh, there are no real news reports of anything like that happening. In fact, maybe the reverse. Uh, and then you also have a situation where, you know, maybe people destroyed their guns, but there's no evidence, there's no discussions about something like that happening. You know, the third option is maybe you had a lot of people simply lying that they owned long guns when they were asked in surveys. And I guess I'm fairly skeptical of that actually being the case. And that all of a sudden they didn't want to lie about having uh, long guns when they were asked in these surveys. So uh, <clears throat> there are lots of reasons for believing that this is a pretty useless number in terms of uh, any type of accuracy. Okay, so we've had two discussions here. We've had one about uh, deaths, you know, homicides uh, for, uh, by countries, and we've also had gun ownership data, and I've tried to go through and talk to you a little bit about the problems with each of these. But we put these two together now. Uh, this is from Vox. Uh, again, in, on this one axis they, axis, they have the guns for 100 people from the small arms survey. And here they have gun-related deaths per 100 people, so you have homicides and suicides. And the United States is supposedly way out here, and of course uh, they're very unique, the claim is, in terms of gun ownership. Uh, and, uh, and so they get this very positive line that goes through here. So let's just break this down. You, we got lots of seats in here if you want. Um, let's look at it in terms of just homicides. So we have the small arms survey of uh, firearms per 100 people and the homicide rate. And you can see the positive relationship where supposedly more guns per 100 people is associated with 
a higher homicide rate. Well, let me just show you how sensitive this is to uh, how, how it's set up. So let's just say we ask the question, what can the United States learn from other countries in terms of the relationship between gun ownership rates and homicide? So all you've done is take the United States out of this. So before we got a positive line, now, and I'm not even including countries like Brazil and Russia uh, in this discussion, they have very low uh, gun ownership <laughs> rates and, uh, and high uh, homicide rates, as I've shown you, much higher homicide rates than the United States. But even removing those, if you remove the United States, you get a negative relationship, a slight negative relationship that's there between this measure of uh, gun ownership and homicide. Now, as I mentioned, there are real problems with the small arms survey for like Switzerland and Israel. If you put the United States back in, and just for people who know low statistics, when you do a regression, what you're doing is you're trying to fit a line to these data points. But there's, you're doing what's called minimizing the sum of the squared error. So there's the difference between the line and the point that you're looking at, uh, you're, you're, when you have a big distance, you're squaring that. So you're giving really large weight to what we call outliers, places that are far out. And so one country really far out from the rest of the sample can have a huge impact. And that's what I was just showing you about the line, you know, removing the United States, how that reduces it. But if we were, we talked about the problems with Switzerland and Israel before. Those countries actually have gun possession rates that are higher than what we have here in the United States. You can leave the United States in, still remove uh, countries like Russia and Brazil. And if you put them in, they would be out here and just those two by themselves, not even fixing any of the other areas that we could talk about, that would make the line negative too. So, <clears throat> you know, the, I'll show you one other thing here. So here, here, if you put the United States in, don't fix Switzerland or Israel, but include countries like Brazil and Russia, which have low gun ownership rates and uh, high homicide rates, again, you get a negative relationship. Now, I told you before, one of the problems is how do you measure gun ownership? And they measure gun ownership as guns per 100 people. I don't think that's a good measure. A much better measure is what percent of the population owns guns. In Brazil, it's like less than one-tenth of one percent of the population has a license to own a gun. I mean, it's amazingly small. Uh, so when you combine that with the fact that they have a really high gun ownership rate, the small arms survey, their they're gun should be over here a little bit. Russia should also be over here. Uh, Mexico, probably around the, about 17, 18 percent, 18 guns per 100 people should be about 2 percent of the population legally owns a gun. And so those types of things also would work to make this more, even more of a negative relationship if you fixed it. You know, kind of the bottom line is if you allow people to kind of make up data and nobody cares about asking them how they made up the data, people can pretty much control the debate here. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> this is for all countries, not just the developed countries that we were showing before. Uh, and you can see the negative relationship. And again, this isn't fixing any of the data problems, including all the ones the way they want it measured. Uh, you get a negative relationship here. And uh, uh, this is the firearm homicide rate uh, with all the problems that we talked about it. Okay, well, people will combine uh, this gun ownership data with uh, mass shooters per 100 million people. And they get a very similar claim. Uh, again, we're not fixing the data, we're just using it the way they say here. There's this study by this guy named Adam Lankford at the University of Alabama that came out in 2015, probably the, one of the most widely quoted and cited academic studies this century across the world. And he claimed that the United States made up 31% of all the mass public shooters between 19, or 1966 and 2012. But up until a couple weeks ago, he refused to give out his data set. And I've 
tried dealing with that, and uh, I didn't believe his numbers. I finally went out, we spent about $70,000 to go and count cases from around the world, and I'll talk about that. But Langford claims uh, that there were 202 shooters in the rest of the world over those 47 years and 90 in the United States. <laughs> President Obama constantly made references to this type of claim. When the administration was asked about it, they would go and cite this study by Langford. Uh, you know, these, I can give you like 36 quotes uh, from Obama on this. He said, I say this every time we've got one of these mass shootings. This just doesn't happen in other countries. The one thing we do know is that we have a pattern now of mass shootings in this country. There's no parallel anywhere else in the world. You don't see murder of this kind of scale with this kind of frequency in any other advanced nation on Earth. And again, he would cite this stuff by Langford. Uh, as I say, Langford wouldn't give out his data. When he finally gives out his data, it turns out for the rest of the world, he was only counting cases where one shooter was involved. In the United States, he included Columbine, where there was two. Uh, but of course, there are other shootings in the United States where more than one person was involved. And uh, you know, he claimed he was using the FBI definition of mass public shooters, which doesn't limit it to just one. And he was missing a number of cases where <clears throat> one shooter was involved. I only looked at the last 15 years of the period of time that he uh, looked at, here a quote from the media that had asked him for the data and he refused to give it out. Um, and uh, uh, we looked at just the last 15 years from 1998 to 2012, we found over 3,000 mass public shooters outside the United States. He claimed that in 15 years, he claimed that there were 202 uh, uh, outside the United States over 47 years, over three times longer period. And uh, if you, we've updated the data through 2015. Uh, the U.S. makes up about 1.4%, 1.49% of the murders from mass public shootings worldwide, about 2.2% of the attacks, and about 1% of the shooters. The United States has about 4.6% of the world's population, so we're actually way below the world average. And there are lots of countries, even in Europe, that have higher murder rates. You know, people may not appreciate this, but I'll just give you an example. France, in one year, 2015, had more casualties from mass public shooters than the United States had over the entire Obama presidency. You know, you had something like the concert hall shooting in November uh, 2015, where you had like 130 people were killed and hundreds wounded. Uh, and, uh, you know, they have lots of other attacks. They just have had a couple attacks recently in France. These usually don't get much attention. Um, uh, if you look at all the list of cases, the United States ranks 65th in the uh, 89 countries that we were able to find data on mass public shootings uh, in terms of murder rates. France, Russia, Norway, Finland, Switzerland are all some of the major European countries uh, with at least 25% higher murder rates for mass public shootings in the United States. But there's one thing I want to make clear, and that is these are still overestimates of the share of the United States because I, unlike Langford, who claimed to have a complete list, I, I know I haven't been able to find it. I don't know how to find mass public shootings in Africa where four people were shot from the 1960s. Okay, I don't even know where to start with that. Or the 1970s or the 80s or even the 90s. I had a hard time just getting it for the last 15 years of this period. And uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, kind of shows you how I spend my Saturday nights. But I've gotten a hold, <laughs> I've kind of gotten a hold of uh, a report that the Solomon Islands uh, in the Pacific had put together. Uh, for their national police agency. And, um, and I was reading it on a Saturday night, and uh, I came across a paragraph of this 152-page report which just casually mentioned that over this five-year period of time they had had three large mass public shootings where at least 10 people were killed in each of the attacks. <clears throat> and uh, I said, wow, this is amazing. I mean, this is a country with 500,000 people. Uh, 
So just to put that in perspective, uh, the United States population is 640 times larger than the Solomon Islands. By the way, the Solomon Islands banned guns during this period of time. And uh, so if we had the same rate per capita of mass public shootings where at least 10 people were killed, we'd have to have 1,800, over 1,800 mass public shootings where at least 10 people were killed. So these are mass public shootings by the FBI definition are shootings not involving some other type of crime like a drug related gang battle or a robbery that went wrong or some other type of crime where there was a shooting in public uh, where at least four or more people were killed. That's the traditional FBI definition. And uh, uh, so anyway, I, I said, wow, this is amazing. So I contacted the national police. I emailed them. I didn't really get a response. I emailed them again, didn't really get a response. I finally decided to call them up. Uh, we were completely unhelpful. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, I'll go call up the newspaper that's in the country there. But apparently the national police had already talked to the national newspaper guys and told them you got this wacky researcher from the United States asking about our mass public shootings, and they wouldn't talk to me about it. And so anyway, I kept on pushing. Eventually, I realized what was going on, and that is, where do you think the Solomon Islands gets most of its money from? Tourism. So here you have some nutty guy in the United States who's asking them about all the mass public shootings that they have in the country. And it's kind of like, there are two outcomes. Either one, the guy gets the thing and nobody listens to him, and so it's no harm, okay? But, or, uh, somebody does listen to him, and uh, people don't want to go to the Solomon Islands anymore for <coughs> tourism. And so it's kind of like, there's like no gain to them, and maybe a loss, and so why go and answer the guy's questions? So I just have, they don't report it for any other year, uh, so I just have the uh, shootings for five years, and just those five years have a huge rate. Even, who knows what happens in the other years? Um, and uh, uh, you know, I have no doubt that there are many other countries that I don't have all the data for. Even the Solomon Islands, you think, well, uh, go look up online. The thing is, their newspaper didn't really go online until like 2010. And even then, it's not like our newspapers. It's not like you have uh, these old articles you can look at. They just have like their current articles up today. And then who knows what happens to the other articles, but they don't have uh, a search, you know, a search bar or something where you can go and look at their past articles that are there. So anyway, uh, what happens when you go and you uh, uh, correct the numbers, kind of use the numbers that we have there and look at uh, the gun ownership data and uh, the number of people killed per 100,000 people? Rather than that positive line that I showed you before, you actually find that the countries with more guns, and again, this is using the small arms survey, which I cautioned you about, uh, uh, you get a negative relationship there between uh, gun ownership and uh, um, and uh, and the deaths. And this is this is real quick. That slide that eliminated the justifiable murder. This is um, mass public shooting. Mass public shooting. Okay. This is the murder rate from them. So and this cuts out the two real outliers with Iraq and and the Central Re uh, African Republic, and you still you still get a very negative relationship. So let's look at some other claims that are out there. Uh, you know, you frequently hear, if you read the New York Times or the media, they'll say there's about 32% of American households own a gun. And this is from something called the General Social Survey from an outfit called NORC, which is at the University of Chicago. And uh, I'll tell you one story, just give you an example. A few years ago, ABC News was doing uh, a whole set of pieces that basically covered like three days on Good Morning America, the Evening News, and Nightline uh, about the risks of guns in the home. And I spent about an hour and a half talking to the producer, and at the end of the time that we were talking, she just casually mentioned, she said, well, 
you know, these gun deaths probably are a problem of the past because fewer and fewer households are owning guns. And, you know, if you said hopefully in a few years or whatever, there'd be so few people that own guns in the home that it really won't be an issue anymore. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, I assume uh, you're referring to something like the general social survey. She said, yeah, that's what we were referring to. And I said, well, uh, you know, you guys have a survey on gun ownership in the home, ABC News, and your survey shows it's flat over time in the 40, you know, 40 to 45 percent range. She said, no, that's not true. I said, yeah, you have your own survey that shows a completely <laughs> different result. And she didn't believe me. I said, well, look, I'll send you the link to your survey, and you can go and look at it. So I sent her the link to her survey. She and I talked one other time after that. And so anyway, when it came out, when they had this massive series over three days, the only survey that they kept on citing over and over again was the GSS survey and not their own survey. And I've kind of come to the impression that the reason why they like the GSS survey uh, is because of the fact they want to make gun owners feel marginalized, okay? Uh, if you feel like gun ownership's falling, that it's going out of favor, that there's relatively few people that own guns, and in fact, this was one of the kind of the, the comments that they made a couple times in this new series, uh, then it may convince other people not to own guns because they say, well, you know, people, it's kind of a dying thing. People aren't owning guns anymore. And so often over time, over the last few years, you probably hear these claim that, well, gun sales have come up, but the number of people owning guns has been falling. And it's basically because of this uh, GSS survey. So here's, here's the ABC News Washington Post survey. Doesn't look like it's falling, to me. <laughs> but uh, you can see it's bouncing between about 46% and about 41% over time. Uh, they've stopped doing the survey a few years ago. But uh, anyway, uh, you mean it didn't give them the data they were looking for? Well, uh, I have to say I know uh, Tom Smith, who's run the GSS survey. I, you knew him when I taught at the University of Chicago. It's, you know, he and I were friendly. It was kind of before I'd done most of my research or any of my research, and my views have changed a fair amount over time on these things. And uh, Tom was telling me one time at lunch. He said, "Well." Uh, because I was talking about the change over time it, with him, and he was saying, well, you know, this is great because hopefully it will cause uh, politicians to go and do the right thing over time if we can convince them that relatively few voters out there own guns so they don't care about it as much. Anyway, I'm going to show you the most recent survey done by a group of things. I haven't updated the data through 2019, but I have it up through 2018 here. And uh, you can see ABC News, General Social Survey, Quinnipiac, CNN, Pew, Gallup, uh, CBS News, YouGov, Monmouth, NBC News, Wall Street Journal, <laughs> and this is the average without the GSF. So the blue line here is the percentage of households that said they owned a gun. The burnt orange is the percent that refused to answer the question, and then the green is apportioning the burnt orange kind of in their proportion to the, that said that they owned a gun in the home. And uh, you can see the GSS here is in the low 30% range. Well, you know, all the other ones are at least 40% or so. Uh, in fact, the ones from last year, uh, from uh, Mon Month and NBC News, Wall Street Journal, have it at 46 to almost 50% here uh, when you look at the green lines, 49, 48%. Now there are a couple things, I mean I could give you like 10 hours of lectures about these uh, surveys, but I'll just tell you one or two things that are marginally interesting. One of the things is uh, married men and married women say they own guns in the home at really significantly different rates. Married women are about 15 percentage points less likely to say a gun is owned in the home than a married man is. Now, is it that the guy owns a gun and he's not telling his wife? I suppose that's possible. Uh, the other possibility is that women may be more reticent to go and say that a gun is owned in the home than a man is. One thing I'll note for you 
You may know some of the dates on some of these things. So like you have March uh, 2018. They tend to do, they don't do these surveys at the same time every year. If it was me doing the survey, I would pick you know, June or March, whatever it is, and I do the same survey every year at the same time. What they tend to do is after there's a big mass public shooting is when they go and do these surveys. So it's another reason to believe maybe they're underestimating, maybe, you know, if there's all this stuff called for gun control and it's demonized more than usual right then, people might be more reticent. But it may be particularly women who might be even more reticent than men to go and acknowledge that they own a gun in the home at that time. Anyway, if you were to assume that women and, and, and women own guns in their households at the same rate that men do, when you have married women and married men, married women own guns at the same rate that married men do in the household, uh, that would add about seven percentage points uh, to these survey numbers. And so you'd be talking about, uh, you know, over 50% or near 50% for almost all these other surveys there. And, uh, you know, that's hardly what uh, the claim they'd like to have. So, um, uh, I'm going to skip this. Well, maybe I can talk about this briefly. So one of the claims that you frequently hear is about uh, whether people use guns properly or not, whether people with concealed carry permits are a danger to others or not. Uh, we just recently, this last week, finished a study uh, that we've been working on for a long time where we looked at all the school shootings in the United, any type of school shooting, accidental, discharge, somebody just firing and hitting nobody to mass public school shootings uh, from 19, or from 2000 to 2018. There's like 320 of those uh, types of shootings. There are 20 states that have teachers that uh, that can carry, that actually do carry guns on school property uh, during this period of time. Uh, it varies a lot across schools. You have like Utah and New Hampshire and Rhode Island during this period of time. If a teacher had a concealed carry permit, they could carry on school property. Rhode Island changed its rules uh, late last year uh, to ban it, but they had it during this period of time. Um, and uh, and you have other states like Texas. It's like uh, as of the end of last year, they had like 313 school districts uh, that allowed uh, that actually had people carrying. Uh, Ohio and Oklahoma have like over 200 each. We could not find one. So there are two questions that come up there. One is, what's the behavior of these uh, teachers with guns? Do they lose control? Do students get a hold of the guns and use it in property? Do the teachers accidentally fire the guns and hurt somebody? We could not find one case over all those years in any of the schools. And it took a lot of work because we had, when we found a case, we had to call up the school, find out what rules were in place at that period of time. We could not find one case at any school where teachers were able to carry a gun where anybody was shot, either wounded or killed, uh, during anything close to school hours. There are a couple cases like at 2 a.m. in the morning uh, where obviously there are no teachers around where you'd have some gang fight that was occurring. But during the period of time from 6 a.m. to midnight, we could not find a single case. And there was no accidental shots, there was no cases where students had gotten a hold of the guns. Uh, there was one accidental shot, but it was way outside of school hours, and nobody was harmed. But anyway, this is for permit holders generally here that I have. And what you find is that last year, there were about 17.5 million Americans with a concealed carry permit. Uh, Revocation rates for any reason are tenths or hundreds of one percentage point. Revocation rates for firearms related violations are about a thousandth of a percentage point. And I can go through the data, I just mentioned Texas here. Texas had about 1.36 million permit holders in uh, 2018. 163 permit holders were convicted of a misdemeanor or a felony. That's a revocation rate of about 0.01 percent, so it's about one hundredth of one percentage point. If you look at firearms related violations, that's about, it was about 0 .001. This is from 
2017, I should update these numbers, but uh, you can see here uh, the misdemeanors for uh, felonies, for police, there's data from police quarterly, uh, and this underestimates it for police, but about one-tenth of one percent of police officers were convicted of misdemeanors or felonies. Uh, so that's really low compared to the general population. This is less than one twentieth the rate of the general population, but permit holders were convicted at about one-tenth that rate. And for firearms-related uh, violations, it was similar mm -hmm. thing. Now, one thing that you often see in the debate about gun control are suicides in guns. And the types of graphs that you show here, I could show you the same type of graph again from the New York Times from Nicholas Kristof, is that <coughs> firearm suicides are much more successfully completed than other types. And they'll show cutting and poison. Poison usually involves things like sleeping pills and, uh, and firearms. And it's true if you compare these things. I mean, most uh, uh, sleeping pill suicides are for women, and you're often talking about actually people taking five or six sleeping pills. Now, do I advise you to take five or six sleeping pills? Probably not. But, you know, there's a good chance you're not gonna kill yourself by taking five or six sleeping pills. Um, here's some data just as a comparison to show the rate of success here. So you have shotgun to a head, but there are not a lot of these, simply because shotguns are relatively long and not everybody has an arm as long as I do. But, you can see those are about 99% successful. Cyanide, which is not that difficult to obtain, is about 97% successful. Gunshot to the head is about 97% successful. Explosives, 96%. Uh, hit by a train, this is really quite successful. <laughs> this is what they do in Japan. And, uh, um, uh, and, and trucks, if you want to make sure you are successful in killing yourself, you step out in front of a big truck that's driving down the street, they'll do it too. And the thing is, these are actually less painful. There's data on how painful the different ways of committing suicide are. Like you're sure, it's instantaneous, you're crushed right away. Uh, jumping from a height, 93% uh, successful, shotgun to the chest, 89.5, uh, hanging. 89.5. And uh, anyway, there are other things I could go through. What time is it right now? Oh my Quarter to seven. Quarter to seven. Okay. Um, one thing you frequently see mentioned in the news, I'll do one more quickly, is the claim that uh, Australia's gun buyback that they had in 1996 and 97 uh, was responsible for a big, you know, 60% drop in uh, firearm homicides and similar drop in firearm suicides. And uh, uh, here's the problem that we have. And people, a lot of people do empirical research are not very good at it. And here's the problem. Let's say I have a line that's straight, perfectly straight line that's falling over time. Let's say it's firearm suicides. And I change, and I change a law and I'm looking at the before and after averages. The after averages are below the before averages, but does that mean that the law had an impact? Again, this is a perfectly straight line. It doesn't wiggle or deviate at all any place or when the law changes. I don't know, I would look at it and I'd say, well, you know, something was happening beforehand. It continually happened when the law changed, continually happening afterwards. It's not really obvious to me. In fact, you could have picked any date along that line, and the after average would be below the before average, right? Well, what did that accomplish there? Not a lot. And so what you really want to do is to see, you know, did the rate of, was there a discontinuous change? Did the rate of decline go faster or slower after that period? And in fact, if you look at Australia, you, you find that firearm homicides and suicides were falling beforehand. They were falling afterwards, but actually at a slower rate afterwards than they were falling beforehand. And I'll just show you one other thing, I guess, really quickly. This is one thing that uh, a lot of people, a lot of gun control activists would say, if we could only regulate guns for safety like we do cars, because they point out this ex extreme success that they claim has existed for car regulations. And this is a graph that Nicholas Kristof did. Now again, uh, just so you know, the first federal safety uh, regulations for cars went into effect in 67, 68, 
uh, the law got passed in uh, 63, uh, and, uh, but they were falling before and they were falling after. I'll just show you something here. But this is kind of a longer period of time. This goes back to where the data of fatalities per 100, mile, 100 million miles driven from 1920 is falling over the whole period of time. In fact, if you look at any type of accidental death, it's always falling, anything. It's falling over time, and there's reasons for that that I can talk about. But it's interesting here, what happened when they passed the law? It kind of stopped falling, kind of went up a little bit, and then went down, but at a slower rate than it was falling before. Does anybody know why, when they passed the federal law, it paused there, and then why fatalities went at a slower rate afterwards? Reporting. Yeah. You're a car company. Car companies were making all sorts of innovations for safety before this, you know, shatterproof glass, seat belts, uh, collapsible steering wheels, all sorts of things, because people like safer cars, and so companies competed on that basis. But you go and design, let's say, an airbag, okay, you gotta make a lot of machines and change your production facilities to go and deal with that. How does the government regulate these things? The government doesn't just go and say, produce airbags. The government goes out and says, you produce an airbag, it has this characteristics, uses this type of gas, has this type of firing rate, will be installed in this particular way in the car, it has to be fastened in certain places. And so you're a car manufacturer and you say, you know, I'm gonna have to put a billion dollars or whatever, you know, $800 million into tooling up to go and put in these airbags. Well, maybe the way we're gonna do it is different from the way they're gonna mandate that we have to do it. We can't just say we have the airbags, we have to show them that we've done the airbags in exactly the way that the government wants us to put it in. And so the problems that you face is that I may spend this $800 million and then a year later the government comes out and says this is how we wanna do it. You gotta rip all that up and then put it in again. Well, they don't wanna waste that much money on that thing, because these machines and stuff last a number of years. And so uh, what happens is, is that stops people from innovating and, and makes them wait until the government makes up its mind. Well, government's not really super fast in terms of uh, coming up and making up its mind on these standards. And so that's the reason why you actually have seen, you know, so again, if it's falling over time, you can pick any year, and the after average is going to be below the before. You want to see whether it's falling at a faster or a slower rate. Anyway, there's, I have about 20 more of these things I can go through, but I know I'm getting near out of time, and I want to, I know I took some questions before, but I'm